Hello everyone, uh, my name is Tao. I'm from Ads Serving Infrastructure Team from LinkedIn. Today, I'm going to share a set of cash strategies with some best practice, which we have been tested and implemented in our productions. We will use some examples to explain the concept and hopefully you can find them useful and apply them in your use cases. So as we all know, um, cash is everywhere. Cash could be in the CPU to reduce the fallback rate to the main memory to improve the CPU running speed. Cash could be in the browsers to avoid downloading the same content. Uh, and also cash could be some remote cache implementation such as Redis, Memcached to speed our, our applications. Cache is also popular in one of our popular video games named Counter-Strike. There's a map called Cache. But today we are not going to talk about the CSGO's cache, but more focused on traditional cache implementation. So this is the traditional read-through cache architecture. So we have a service talking with the DB. We can easily optimize the system by adding a cache in the middle. The cache itself could be a local cache and could be a remote cache. This cache will help us to reduce the QPS and improve the latency so that we can have a better scalability, better user experience, and better cost to serve. Today, we are not going to deep dive how the cache functions internally. Example, say, how to implement the Redis. This is not our today's topic. But today, we will more focus on given a cache, how to use the cache efficiently and make our application running faster. So this is the traditional read-through cache implementation. So first of all, we create a cache. In most of the cases, it's an LRU cache. We set a TTL, the time to live, meaning the key will expire after five minutes. Then we will create a functions to get the values. In these functions, we will first check whether the data presenting the cache, and if the cache is missing, we fall back to DB. Once the data is loaded from the DB, then we update the cache so that in the next recall, when they query the same data with the same key, we can directly extract from the cache. It's almost, I would say, almost 90% of cache are implemented in such a way. However, in some corner cases, this cache may break the system so hard. And we will give you some example. So when you look at this implementation, the first things come into the picture is the TTL. TTL means if a cache items meet the TTL, then the cache item will be deleted. So let's, real, uh, let's look at a potential, potential product issue. So as you know, we are running as tracking system. Every user's click event is validated against our advertiser settings. And those advertiser settings is stored in DB and we cache them locally. One day, our DB crashed it. After five minutes, the cache start to expire, so system cannot access the settings. So the tracking events, start tracking system stop processing as tracking events. After 10 minutes, our SRE noticed the issue and issued the traffic shift so that the traffic go to another data center as a mitigation. But as you notice, during this 10 to five minutes, still a large number of events have been queued up. So when we look at this uh, system, we notice that actually most of the system could tolerate a period of time for data stillness. In our cases, we wish to refresh the cache within five minutes, but we actually could tolerate at maximum 30 minutes for data stillness. So to improve the system robustness, we can introduce soft and hard TTL. When soft TTL comes, the system will attempt to refresh the cache data. The data will still present in the cache until the hard TTL comes. This time gap between the soft and hard TTLs 
give us the enough buffer time for mitigate the issue so as to improve the system robustness. Soft and hard TTL is very helpful to improve the robustness. But if also, if we do and adopt async cache refreshness, this could also further improve the performance. So in this example, after the first read call happens, the cache data get popped into the cache later. Then the cache itself will start a daemon thread. We are periodically refresh the cache after the soft TTL. So that the data will be fresh during the whole life cycle when it's in the cache. So as you imagine, uh, when the readers start to query the data, they were always loading from the local cache and the data is always in a fresh state. After readers stop reading the data, then after the hard TTR, the data will be deleted from the cache. This kind of soft and hard TTR with the async cache refresh will bring a lot of benefits. First of all, we no longer need to wait for the DB calls. And second, for the cache missing for the hot data, we don't have any such case anymore. And also, it offers a better data freshness. One other thing we noticed is the TTL doesn't have to be static value. We could change the TTL based on the data change frequency. So if the data get oftenly changed, we can use a short TTL. And if the data is rarely updated, we can use the longer TTL. We can dynamically adjust the TTL based on the change frequency which we can learn as a feedback during the DB4 back calls. Sometimes we may implement some priority job. The job may run every minute. Examples in my, some maintenance job. And these kind of data will expire at the same time because they've been accessed periodically with the fixed interval. This will end with the first traffic to the DB and it's not scalable because it may easily overload the DB. As a solution, we can build a random TTL with a high and a low watermark so that DBQPS could be stable and being smoothed out. For the cache, which is really need freshness, we can build a notification pipeline. The system could directly learn the DB changes and send the notification to the cache data. As an implementation, we can directly send in the updated and the new cache data into the cache. Or as a simple implementation, we can just delete the cache data from the cache and let the application to fall back to DB. If the data updating QPS is very high, we also need to build a filter in the middle to reduce the notification pipeline overhead. So to quickly recap what I say, for the time to live, we should implement a soft and hard TTL to improve the system robustness. Other than that, we should also build up async cache refresh to optimize the latency. And then we can build up a dynamic timeout, sorry, dynamic TTL to optimize the DB4 back QPS and further improve the data freshness. And also for the real-time cache, we can build a notification pipeline. Fallback will happen when the cache is missing. And when the cache missing happened, we need to extract it from the backend DB store. Let me share one real production issue we've been faced. So we are running as tracking system. We cache a lot of uh, data uh, to improve the ranking speed. And some of the hot feature data are widely used in almost all the requests. And one day, all of those cache features expires almost at the same time. Now, all the requests fall back to DB, and DB is start to be overloaded and respond very, very slowly. The DB fallback calls are timing out, is timing out, and so no update back to the cache. But given the time flies, more and more cache items expires, more and more requests fall back to DB call, and finally we overload the DB and DB is crashed. 
That's one of the big lessons we have learned from this issue is we need to dedupe the fallback cost. Instead of making many fallback in parallel to request the same key, we could dedupe the fallback cost and only issue one fallback key cost and put the rest of the request, which is request is exactly the same key into the waiting step and unblock them only if we get the fallback from the DB. Second lesson we learned from it is we need to build async cache updating. We should run the DB fallback in an async thread so that if the DB responds slowly, the system could still update the cache successfully. So in this diagram, when the first request reads in the data, the data is not in the cache. So we will issue a DB fallback call in a cache thread. Request one will continue and will time out aggressively to serve the user's request in time, while the DB cache fallback call will continue waiting for the DB response. This could be take a long time. After long time waiting, the DB will respond the data. And due to it's in another thread, we can update it in the cache. After the data is stored in the cache, so if there's another request, which is request two, reading the same data, it could directly benefit from the cache. So if you're looking for, and also if you're looking for extremely fast cache data extraction, we could choose to load the data from the cache only and not waiting for any DB4 backup. The performance will be bad during the warm-up, but after warm-up, the overall latency will be consistently low. The final lesson we learned from it is we need to cache the partial and empty result. When it's a big batch gets to the DB, we, may, I, we need to accept the partial result from the DB and cache them. And if the data is done present in DB, we could cache this empty result as the placeholder to reduce the cache fallback volumes. And also, if the DB fallback throw an arrow, we should also cache its error stats and treat them as empty to avoid overload a problematic DB. And finally, if we want to recover faster, we can set a shorter TTL for the error stats so that once the DB recovers, the system could go back to normal immediately. One of the big challenge of using the cache is cache warmup. During the warm-up, the overall performance is downgraded so significantly. But cache warm-up issues happens when we restart the service, especially when we do daily code release. The cache warm-up, uh, the cache will be deleted because all the in-memory cache is gone. Sometimes we may also put the physical machines into the maintenance and we have to deploy our service into a new host. So during the moment, there's no data presenting the new host. Also, when we release a new code, uh, our new cache schemas may change and we cannot use the old cache data anymore. All of the situation may end with no cache data and will downgrade the performance significantly. So one of the good practice is to persist the cache to its local disk when shut down and load it up when restarting. Uh, one of the big notice or notes for this feature is please, please remember to implement a TTL checker before loading the cache. Because if the hole has been down for days, then the cache on the disk could be very, very old. And your system may run a, a, in a totally unexpected situation because of this data, uh, because of this stored data. If your cache warm-up is ex very expensive, for example, it takes one or two hours to fully warm up the cache, you can also periodically flush the cache so that avoid unexpected service crash, such as being killed with dash time. Persist the cache, fix the local cache warm-up issue, but not really fix the new host deployment because there's no new cache on the new host. As a solution, we can build a cache rsync. Idea here is copy the cache file from its peer node. And most of the time you can imagine different hosts in the same cluster 
are serving the same traffic, and most of the cache items are exactly the same, so that they can be shared between each other. And uh, so when the host B doesn't have a cache item, they could contact the peer node, which is host A, and download one copy. All of those four, uh, previous solutions are mainly designed for local cache solutions, but if the service is okay with additional overhead by reading from a remote cache, then we could put all the data into remote cache as one of the preferable solutions. And also, when we introduce a new cache, to avoid invalid all cache items, it's better to use a backward compatible new schema. As a downside, due to the backward compatible, if the new code has a bug, it may pollute the cache data. So in this case, rollback the code will not fix the problem because uh, the data is get polluted. As one of the suggestions, we was suggest to reverse the reserve the functionality to force the bootstrap. Basically, clean up the whole cache and ask node to load everything from the DB to fix the polluted data issue. So to quickly recap what I say, for improve the cache warmup, we can introduce a cache persistence to write the data into the local disk and load it up. As of issue with the uh, deploy to a new host, we can share the cache with peers, such as either download the cache from peers or use the shared remote cache. And finally, for the schema resolution, it's always suggested to use the backwards compatible schemas, but also a build a function to clean up the cache to fix data pollution issue. As we all know, uh, large cache size usually improve the performance a lot because, because we can cache more data and we can improve the cache hit rate. If we can somehow hold the whole data set, the cache hit rate go to 100%. In this case, we will significantly improve the system performance. But we all know the physical memory size is limited. So, so as to improve the memory footprint, we need to improve the cache efficiency so that we can cache more data. One of the first things to improve the cache efficiency is to choose a memory efficient data structure. In Java, primitive type usually takes only four bytes via the boxing Java object takes 16 bytes, which is about four times difference. So to improve the memory efficiency in the cached value, we will suggest people to convert a list of integers to an array of the primitive types. And also for small Java classes, we will suggest to convert them into a flattened out data structures. With those kind of optimization, one of our data structure have been reduced the memory usage from seven gigabytes to 700 megabytes, which is about 10 times improvements. Other than that, we can also dedupe and remove redundant objects. We can think about point the same object uh, if the value are exactly the same. One of the common good practice is point the empty list into an immutable empty collections in the collection utils. And some of the data formats is not friendly for memory efficiency. Example, say JSON string. In this example, there is a lot of redundant strings such as member ID, scores, they are redundant. As a solution, we can implement a symbol table to map the string towards integers. And then in the JSONs, in the PSONs, we could store them as a integer reference. So this is an implementation inside LinkedIn RESTly PDSC system. And th with this kind of simple map, we have successfully reduced the size by four times. In a remote cache system, memory usually is not a big problem because we can easily add more machines to scale up. However, in the remote service, RPC 
become the new bottlenecks. As one of the major contributor is maybe not in the network, but actually the schema serialization and deserialization. So it's important to pick up an efficient schema solutions when you store the data into a remote cache system. This is the table where I got from a benchmark you can use as a reference. In general, a specific schema, such as photobuff, arrows, are usually faster than the generic schema, such as JSON message pack. We have been talking a lot how to optimize the cache size efficiently to scale the, to reduce the memory footprint. However, due to the increasement of data sets, data set size, and we may not able to cache all the hot data into one machine anymore. So the latency requirement is sometimes very restricted, meaning we cannot access the data from a remote cache store, such as Redis, Memcached. In this case, we need to explore sharding solution. By sharding, it means we divide the whole cluster into multiple shards. And each shard, we are responsible for a subset of the total content. So instead of every node need to be in charge, all requests, all content, now each shard only responsible for part of it. In this example, before that, every node need to respond for C1 to C4, and now within the sharding, each node only respond for C1 and C2 or C3 and C4. With this proposal, we can easily horizontally scale up. If we think about introduce four shards, then our cache size will be reduced to 25%. In this case, we can cache more data to improve the system performance. So uh, this is to recap what I presented in today's tech talk. First of all, uh, we talking about TTL, we should introduce the soft and hard TTL to improve the system robustness. Other than that, uh, we can build async refresh, which is improve the TTL efficiency. And then we can introduce the dynamic TTL to adjust the TTL based on the data change frequency and for the real-time cache, we can build a notification pipeline. When we're talking about the cache fallback, uh, one of the big lessons we learned is we need to do the dedupe so that don't issue multiple requests in parallel with the same key. And also we should do some async fallback calls so that if the fallback takes a longer time, we can still update the cache. And then uh, for the partial empty error stat, we should store them into the cache and make sure the cache uh, don't rely on those empty requests, error re requests to overload the DB when they are in a problematic state already. And then we talk about cache warmup to reduce the cache warmup period of time. One of the lessons we learned is uh, we can introduce the uh, local cache persistency. We can download the cache from peers and when the remote cache is acceptable, we can use a shield remote cache. And finally, for the cache resolution, we can introduce backwards schemas, uh, schema, a backwards compatible schema to uh, reuse the old cache items. When we talk about cache efficiency, we talk about how to build a cache with a memory friendly using the primitive type VX the boxing object. And also we talk about how to use a symbol table to remove the redundant strings. And finally, we talk about sharding, which is the horizontal scalable solution to further improve the memory efficiency, especially when the remote cache is not a feasible solution. I would like to special thanks to many people who has been working and optimize our cache and explore those kind of different best practice. I would also like to thank many people who have been providing valuable feedback and help for this SRE contact talk. And this is all, and thank you for your attention today. I will say definitely there are a lot of other cash strategies 
and other best practice learning. And due to the time limitation, we are not able to discuss them today. And if you have some better suggestions or you want to continue the discussion, you can add me through the LinkedIn. Please put SRECon as the connection reason so that we can uh, connect and discuss more. And ho hopefully you'll find this tech talk helpful and wish you can apply them in your future use cases and improve your cash efficiency. And thank you, that's it.